Hello and welcome back to Postcard Periodical. I am your host Cthulhu. It's all the same. It's, uh, we're still doing European comics on Postcard Periodical, but I don't know why I make this distinction. But this is Postcard Periodical number four, and it's all on the Daleks. My first Doctor Who content. Looking forward to do some Doctor Who. I keep away from Doctor Who because the world and his wife does it, and they'll do it better than me. So. Um, but I just couldn't resist it any longer. So the Daleks was a TV Century 21 comic strip. It was on the final page. It was, all, it was always in colour. Um, it was just one page strip. Uh, there were 104 instalments and 16 stories. Which It was all one story really, but they kind of can be subdivided. It, it was actually credited in a comic to Terry Nation, but that that's more like a creator credit. It was uh, initially written by Alan Fennell, the editor who started uh, TV Century 21. Um, if you don't know, these were all the comic strips of the Jerry Anderson shows, uh, Fireball XL5, Stingray, Thunderbirds, etc. Lady Penelope had her own strip. Um, you probably know all that. Uh, but back to Alan Fennell, he wrote the first like two, um, possibly three stories, um, or he, he's credited as co-writing with David Whittaker, who David Whittaker was there for the whole run. Uh, now, how much Alan Fennell and David Whittaker divided up um, the story duties, I'm not sure, but I think Alan Fennell basically kicked it off. Alan Fennell had, well, come back to Alan Fennell. And we'll come back to David Whitaker as well. But um, they they wrote, this is just, sorry, I'm getting all tangled already. This is just an overview, isn't it? But basically, Fennell started it, Whitaker continued it with Fennell as script editor. Ironically, David Whitaker was obviously the first uh, Doctor Who script editor. Um, so now the tables turned a little bit. So Richard Jennings was the first artist. Um, he went from the 23rd of January 1965 up to issue 46, uh, the last story of which was um, The Menace of the Monstrons. Um, the next story, Eve of War, he does get a credit on, but I do believe the credit is there because they still use the title panel that he had been using for those first 46 issues. Um, the next story... Uh, can't remember what it's called for now, but it doesn't matter. Um, they use a different title card and he stops getting credited. But during this Eve of War story where they use the old title card, it's uh, Ron Turner doing the art and you can see a difference between Jennings and Turner. Um, and, that, that, and that lasted a couple of uh, issues. And then it goes to Eric Eden. Who, who basically he was filling in while Ron Turner finished off some old commitments and then Ron Turner would come back um, and he would stay until the end of the run of the Dalek strip total. Uh, so Jennings had lasted about a year. Eric Eden came in after this brief gap fill from Ron Turner to do a gap fill of his own. Uh, he did the story of the archives of Fryne. Um, that's totally his. Uh, who's doing the writing. David Wick is still doing the writing, isn't he? Um, so it's not totally Eden's. But you know what I mean. Art-wise, it was all Eden. So then Ron Turner comes back with Rogue Planet. Um, and he basically stays this roughly another year to go. He stays, so we get Jennings first year. Eden was a little bit of a break in the middle. And then Ron Turner continued. There's a lot of um, opinion ever floating around as usual there's always a, an opinion on saying doctor who that uh, ron turner was the best artist a be the best of a good bunch um, that, i mean they are all very good artists personally i prefer robert jennings um i get the impression ron turner is people's favorites because he does have a much stronger sci-fi heritage he was a fan from childhood uh, we'll come to that um we're going to look at the artists in more depth but uh, but you know, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, they're all they're all very good artists. Uh, I prefer Jennings. I can understand totally why people would uh, prefer Turner. And Eden's pretty good as well. Eden's very much 
um, in the American tradition, where they, they focus more on the characters involved rather than the actual scenes. The um, the, the framing is is more about uh, what it's about with uh, the British artists at the time. The Americans are just trying to show you the people involved, and so therefore they're a little bit more expressive. Um, uh, they're a little bit more in close up, um, whereas in uh, in Turner and Jennings, they're, they're more of um, I'm Jen Turner's a little bit of a mixture of style, but Jennings is definitely about um, the setting, like uh, portraying the scenes rather than the characters. I will show you when you flip over from Eden to Turner, you can see a huge difference in style. Um, I mean, you can pick your favourites. It's it's a you know it's it's down to personal taste that, but they are, they're all very good eyes. So I've said that about six times now. So trust me, they're all good eyes. But Jennings was best. Right. So as these uh, sixteen stories were originally published, and they are kind of an ongoing story as well as sixteen um, episodes within that story. Uh, they didn't have any titles. But a big Finnish producer, director, writer, voice actor, I say multi-talented that lot over there. Anyway, this particular multi-talented person was John Ainsworth. He, he researched this, he obviously uh, had contacts, he was able to ring people up. But um, whether these titles are things he's made up totally or he's kind of got the artists or the writers to give him titles. And some of these artists and writers are dead. A couple of them died quite young. Um, uh, we'll come to that. Um, we, um, where was I? I was put off by the idea of dead artists. Now we'll talk about the writers. Alan Fennell, the editor of TV Century 21, um, he, he obviously, as I've said, wrote the first few stories. He was uh, born 1936, lived till 2001. He, he was known for writing episodes for Jerry Anderson for the TV show. He did Fireball XL5, he did Stingray, he did Thunderbirds. He, he wrote a third of the Thunderbirds stories, roughly, um, and many comic strips, including Fireball, Stingray and Thunderbirds as well. Um, so he was quite big, and it was the editor, really. He's kind of really writing stuff to get it going, I think. But um, he then hands over to David Whittaker. David Whittaker, uh, born 28 to 1980, needs no introduction to Doctor Who fans, but just in case uh, there aren't any, he was the first script editor of Doctor Who. So he was there when the Daleks themselves were debuting. Uh, he did 51 episodes in total. He was there for 63 and 1964. Um, and legendary. He wrote many Target novels. He, wrote, he came back to write Power of the Daleks and Evil of the Daleks and Enemy of the World. Uh, his last story was 1970, Ambassadors of Death. As you can tell, I'm reading some notes. Thought I better be professional at last. But not enough to get something to stick them up there so I can pretend I'm not reading notes. Yeah. You know. Nobody comes here for professionalism. Can't even say the word. Um, he actually wrote the first novelisation, um, which was Daleks, uh, entitled uh, Doctor Who in an Exciting Adventure with the Daleks, but it's published by Armada. It wasn't until 73 when the Target books started coming out in that particular range. Got quite a few of them. These, these are here. See them right near Target compilations. All the targets are up there. Not all of them. I haven't got all of them yet. Buy too many comics. So, so they brought out Doctor Who in an exciting adventure with Daleks, and then followed that up with the Crusades in the same year. And, and then those books, I believe, were used to launch the Target series, uh, as well as Bill Strutton's Web Planet came out. So they were the earliest books. So David Whittaker, he's, he's, he's steeped in um, Doctor Who history. So it was a great choice to be writing these stories. There is some talk that Terry Nation might have had some input here at this point, but undocumented, so I can't comment. Whittaker was also for a couple of years, 66 to 68, um, the chairman of the Writers Guild of Great Britain. So it's obviously quite well respected. That's all on the writers I've got. 
Now we go to the artist. The artist, Richard Jennings, 1921 to 1997. Uh, he spent two years at London's Central School of Arts, uh, interrupted by the war. He, he went to air sea rescue with the RAF in the Middle East. So when he came back from the war, he, he travelled around the country. Um, he was working as a fisherman. He was, he was uh, decorating pubs and hotels for a brewery. Um, and then he went back to art. So in 1950, he moves back to London and starts working for the newly formed Eagle on a strip called Tommy Walls, which was an advertising feature. So it would have been just been one page. Um, and it was advertisement Walls ice cream. So every it would have been a hilarious adventure with some ice cream every week. Eventually he ends up doing script and artwork for that. Uh, um, but it does that for three years. So in 1953, he finishes with the ice cream ad and he's doing Storm Nelson with Guy Morgan. Guy Morgan, uh, was a scriptwriter who's worked. He worked on uh, Alexander Corder's Anna Karenina with Vivian Lee and Ralph Richardson. Uh, Albert R. N. starring Jack Hawkins. Um, the Richard Attenborough one, I think, called it Eight Minute Walk, which was uh, an anti-capital uh, punishment film. Um, so he did a lot of comics as well. So uh, well done him for not looking down on comics, being a big Hollywood star. Screenwriter, I'm not sure screenwriters are of stars, but um, good for him. So Jennings also illustrated the Dalek book, the Dalek world, the Daleks out of space book, and there were other strips: Fighting Tomahawks, Robinson Crusoe, Adventures of the Bovril Brigade. There's another advertising job. I don't know if you've had if you don't have Bovril outside the UK, probably do in Australia. Um, it, it's like it's a beefy drink beverage yeah. anyway he also did uh, the lost world for eagle in 1962 island of fire and seeing stars they were all in eagle in 1962 so it sounds to me like none of them really took off um until he got to tornado jones in wham comic uh that was 1964 to 1968 so if you're doing that four or five years that's um that became his next big thing he was doing that while he was doing the art for the Daleks, because that was 65. So, um, he was obviously quite busy and quite in demand. All right, so after Tornado Jones, he just quits comics. Um, which feels like a bit of a restless spirit to me. Maybe that was his um, war experiences, but um, he, he takes work as a long distance lorry driver and supplements the income uh, painting pub signs and doing portraits. Uh, before retiring to Cornwall for his um, later years. Uh, and that's where the um, story of Robert Jennings ends. But obviously we've got this wonderful art to look at. Right, so Eric Eden, it didn't take over directly from Jennings. We did get a couple of Ron Turner strips, but as we're coming back to Ron Turner, I'll do Eric Eden now. So he went to the Southport School of Art. He went with Frank Hampson, who would go on to create Dan Dare um, and would indeed employ Eric Eden well, as soon as he left college uh, in the Hampson Studios, where um, he helped on the Dan Dare strip. He was he was mainly airbrush work. Um, but he, he, he eventually gets sacked after a short period because he was complaining about the long work practices. But he does return later. So, yeah, uh, he goes away and he does a couple of years working in advertising and then he comes back to the studios, uh, all is forgiven apparently, and um, he stays with them until 1959 when the studio is taken over by Odom's Publishing and the studio is basically disbanded at that point. So in this period of the studios being disbanded and going to work um, for TV Century 21, he had, he's, re he's writing some scripts with Frank Bellamy, um, the legend that is Frank Bellamy who is my favourite artist from this era. Um, you will see if you watch any of my Thunderbirds episodes, He's uh, that's not him, that's um, Graham Bleathman, I believe his name is, I can't remember now. Um, he's Graham Bleathman, I can remember. I should be more forthright. So what's that? Oh, it's a little Thunderbirds comic. Yes, they did. Some, they, they're doing a new um, Thunderbirds comic. I should have a look at that, shouldn't I? 
spectrum it's called I suppose dish is um, where was I I was looking around there talking about Frank Bellamy wasn't I right yeah Frank Bellamy is just a legend um, so it could only have done Eric Eden good working for Frank Bellamy um, but after that he goes to work for TV Century 21 and that's how he ends up doing the Dalek stories uh, as a fill-in so he only lived 1928 to 1983s so he was only in his 50s when he died as well so I'm not entirely sure it maybe the pressure of deadlines was getting to these guys I don't know but they had also lived through a world war so we can't all put it out of comics I suppose uh, Ron Turner 1922 to 1998 so he managed uh, 76 years 75 years 76 anyway he was a child science fiction fan uh, he loved Wells, he loved Verne, he loved Edgar Rice Burroughs, he loved Metropolis, he loved The Shape of Things to Come, the movie, he loved uh, the Flash Gordon cinema serials, he's a big fan of Alex Raymond's comic strips. Obviously this, this is hugely influential in his career. He, he, um, he went into comics specifically to illustrate science fiction and when he wasn't able to illustrate science fiction he quickly became disillusioned with, with the career. Another couple of influences were Amazing Stories and Astounding Stories comics. So he's definitely one of us. So in 1936, at the age of only 14, he gets an apprenticeship with Odom Studios, who had taken over the Eagle comic um, and, and that disbanding the Hampton Studios. By 1938, he is... Uh, at the age of 16 presumably then um il providing illustrations for modern wonder magazine so his career is taking off quite early till of course the war comes and he's uh drafted into the british army uh, i don't really know anything about his war record um didn't mention eric eden i believe was working as a, a land worker during the war so it was reserved occupation and wasn't drafted I mentioned the war um, really only because these, these are traumatic events that can shape um, creative people's output and um, since all these writers went on to uh, illustrate the Daleks comic strip which is a warlike race and they are kind of like the central heroes of this, this strip. It's it's quite interesting, especially with all the Nazi parallels that people give to the Daleks. I'm not sure where their minds were when they were doing it, whether they were trying to make the Daleks sympathetic or or look ridiculous or or just um, it played no part in how they thought about it. I don't know, but uh, I, I, I would I do spend a lot of time thinking about things like that, but, you know. I've got a lot of time on my hands. Anyway, he comes out of the war and he starts writing a strip called Big for Skion. Um, I don't know if it's a comic or a publishing house, but it, it, this is this is like um, the the crew of an atomic mole. So this is a fantastic voyage sort of thing. Um, and it would have been like it would have been like late forties, early fifties. I don't really know when it was, but uh, it sounds quite interesting to me. I'm always a sucker for things like Into the Dalek or or any, anything where they put they shrink people down and make like Land of the Giants. I love all that. And now he's now um, Turner decides he's, he's he's not keen on the the deadline world and and um, he wants to be a freelancer. Choose what he does. Um, and uh, he he basically goes, he approaches Tipbit's science fiction um, novels. Uh, which is a publisher, and he convinces them to start a 64-page monthly comic called uh, Titbit Science Fiction Monthly um, that is going to be entirely written, drawn, and lettered by Ron Turner himself. He quickly realises this is not going to happen, and he quickly drafts in um, lots of other people to help him, but this lasts seven issues, and then that's it obviously too much work so then he starts a strip called space ace with uh, lone star comics um they, they he only has to do four pages a month for that um so and then he does five years doing rick random for the super detective library a strip he will um attempt to resurrect for 2000 ad um 
later in his life. But as science fiction dwindled in popularity, um, he started to become disillusioned with the comics. Um, he goes off to work for Craftmaster, doing the illustrations for the paint by number um, kits. In 1965, he's talked back to do um, just a one off stingray for a, like a holiday special, uh, saying like a, just a few pages for a comic strip um, to be put out as a one off. And this leads him being drafted in to do the Daleks. He doesn't really want to leave Craftmasters because Craftmasters is solid money. And he doesn't have all the deadlines and, the, and everything that he's involved with comics. But he's drawn back in because of his love of science fiction. And there he, he basically takes over a year's worth of the Dalek strips. Sees it through to the end. It's also his first colour comic strip. So that probably made a difference as well. But while, while he was at TV Century 21 he did Stingray uh, strip. He did Fireball XL5, Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons, Joe 90, The Champions, Star Trek, Land of the Giants. He worked on 2000 AD doing Robot Wars, the very first serialised story in Judge Dredd. Um, the editors weren't too keen on his style, uh, sadly, so it was gradually taken over by other artists, but you know they all became legends in their time as well, so I'm uh, quite happy to remember Ron Turner for the Daleks and the TV Century 21 stuff that uh, I've been covering. Just at, uh, during the era when comics started to lose a little bit in popularity or big, like, newer, flashier comics came out, TV Century 21 went through a lot of changes. And there were a lot of reboots um, and there was a lot of rivals. So after TV Century 21, he went to work for Action. Um, he picked he does Spinball Slaves and Spinball Wars for them. They were sequels to Death Game 99 and Spinball. He does some work for Battle doing, uh, I think it's Action Force that, that had action men in it um, for American viewers. That's um, uh, G.I. Joe, we called him Action Man. Don't know why. Don't know what the rest of the world calls him. Please don't write in, tell me. So then, yeah, then he goes to work for 2000 AD, he does these Judge Dreads, and that's where he tries to get Rick Random up and running. I'm not sure how successful that was. Uh, I haven't gone that far into 2000 AD yet. Um, I'm also doing Judge Dreads Case Files. I don't know where the first book is, but we're almost reached the second one. I'm just getting with books out, and I? Don't know why. See my notes. See how professional I'm being. He's also done a six-part Dalek strip in the 90s. Um, he died in, uh, was it 97, 98? So I'm, I'm not sure when that was published or whether that was a reprint. I will have to look that up. Um, I believe it was a new, a new print. Um, I'll have to try and dig that out. Um, if I can successfully manage to dig it out soon, it'll be in the um, description. Uh, a link about that. Anyway, that's that's the history of this Dalek strip. As for the content, um, I will come back to that at a later date. And that will be um, something for you to look forward to, won't it? Or avoid, depending on uh, where you stand on the subject of uh, postcards from a wet rock. But um, that's it then for now. Bye!